carried the cross all the way, my sins to atone. Then they nailed him to the cross, great was the pain and the loss, he suffered it all, because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died on the cross, was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all. He loved me. Then they carried him away, placed him in the lonely grave. Surely they thought that this would be the end of that man. Because he loved me, my Savior died on the cross, was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Praise his dear name, he loved me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all. He suffered it all because he loved me. Well, good afternoon, church. Appreciate you being with me this afternoon. And um, grateful to be able to come to, to you tonight by video. And I hope that this video finds you well and that you're doing okay. Um, and just want to start out start out by saying I appreciate all the prayers, <clears throat> excuse me, and support that you guys have given me. I still don't have all my energy back, but I'm feeling a whole lot better. And um, you would think, you know, less than a week out from surgery, at least this is the way I think, that I should be at 100%, but I'm not. I mean, go figure. Uh, but anyway, um, I am feeling pretty good considering all things. Um, and I'm praying, the plan is, listen to me, the plan is to be in church on Sunday. That's what I plan to be, where I plan to be on Sunday, and preaching. Uh, I appreciate Brother Joel who's filled in for me. And uh, he's done a really good job this week, or this past week, and uh, brought a great message. And I appreciate uh, him doing that. I appreciate Diane uh, filling in his singing as well. And uh, I'm grateful that I've got some folks that I can count on whenever something like this happens. And, you know, hope that it don't happen anymore. But uh, you just never know what life's going to bring you. So anyway, in saying all that, thank you. So you guys remember back in the day whenever they would, um, they would have a, like a show would come on TV. And uh, if they had a live studio audience, they would say live from Studio A. Well, we're not in Studio A today. We're in Studio R, Rick's office. Um, I know that was kind of corny, but, you know, I don't tell jokes real well. Anyway, so uh, appreciate, again, appreciate everybody being with me this afternoon. And, uh, of course, we're going to pick back up in our study here in just a little while um, in John chapter number four. And, and I wanted to do tonight uh, this way. Uh, instead of you know having a service on uh, at the church, because I wanted to continue this study, I just kind of felt like I don't, I didn't really want to break it. I mean, we're going to come to the end of chapter four uh, tonight, and uh, chapter four is the chapter. 
excuse me, had a little itch on the back. Chapter 4 is the, the chapter of love uh, that John uh, gives us a wonderful picture, picture of how to love one another, how to love God, the reasons that we uh, should love one another. And I think he'd done a fantastic job uh, by the, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost when he penned this down. And uh, so I wanted to cover it in its entirety uh, consecutively. So that's why we're doing this here tonight instead of skipping a week and me and coming back and, and me come back next week and finish that up. So <clears throat> before we do all that, um, let me just give you a few things that's coming up so everybody will be aware. Um, of course, keep in mind that next Tuesday, um, I believe it is next Tuesday, it's the fourth Tuesday of the month, I think. Let me just check my old handy dandy pocket calendar. What do we do without smartphones before we had them? Yes, yeah, so on the 28th will be um, the ladies meeting. That'll be at 6.30. So come on out and be a part of the ladies meeting at 6.30. And then on October the 2nd, October the 2nd, um, the men are gonna get together. We're gonna meet at Billy's Barbecue. Uh, we're gonna have a time of fellowship there. And then we're gonna come back to the church and if all goes well and we get everything in place, we're going to try to build a permanent cross for the church. If, if you notice the one that's in the front of the church, that's let me tell you a story about that little cross. So that cross was down in the basement. It was in our mechanical room, and we needed a cross on uh, Easter Sunday morning one one year to go out, you know, to be able to meet around the cross for sunrise service. We brought that out. Well, it never made its way back. And in the meantime, the wind sometimes will blow it over. I mean, I know it's pretty heavy, but it's, it's still it's not permanently anchored. Um, one time, I think it broke the top of the cross off. and So anyway, we're going to get rid of that, and we're going to put up a permanent cross. going to try to make it out of six-by-sixes with lap joints and everything, so that bad boy won't go nowhere. Um, and we're going to do that so that when we have sunrise service or we want to gather around the cross at the church, uh, for special services that we'll have something that's permanent uh, that we can do that. So hopefully we'll be able to do that on the 2nd of October. And then um, keep in mind the Fall Fest that'll be coming up, which is called Autumn Fest. It's going to be a good time. The, uh, the youth has got a, uh, a pretty good um, booth that is planned. I, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell what everybody... I'm not going to tell everybody what it is, so... Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. They're they're collectively coming together and um, and doing a a whole scene. It's going to be it's going to be cool. You just need to be there. Um, and and also we're going to be having vendors. We got um, fifteen different vendors. Uh, got notification the other day that now we have not only do we have a taco truck, but we're also going to have a sweet treats um, vendor, which do I think cotton candy and I don't know about. I don't know about candy apples or not, but I do know, or maybe, I don't know what all she does, but I do know she does cotton candy. And uh, so she'll be there as well. Uh, we're going to have bounce houses. Of course, everything's going to be set up for trick-or-treat. And you may be asking, why do we do this? It's, it's not, we're not celebrating Halloween. That's not what we're doing. We're bringing people in so that we can minister the gospel to them. So this is an evangelistical outreach, and it should be treated as such. While we're going to have a good time and, and, and a lot of fun, uh, I find that it's a lot of fun whenever you get a chance to, to share the gospel with people. Uh, last year, let me tell you what it did for us last year uh, as a church. Last year, uh, the majority of our youth program came from our trunk or treat. And uh, we, we hope to be able to continue that, that growth, and um, not only for our kids, but I, I want us to reach out for young adults. I want us to reach out for seniors. And just anybody who comes through, I, I want to have folks that are represented from our church that can put in their hands maybe some literature, something that they can take home and ponder over. But more importantly, I want us to be able to pray through and pray for the people that will be coming that day. Um, I'm just expecting God to do something that day. Uh, we're going to have a great time. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. But I'm expecting God to move. And, and, and I'm going to say it this way, okay? If that's not your, 
If that is, if you're participating in our Autumn Fest and that is not your motivation, I, I'm going to ask you to pray through that and ask the Lord to uh, to put that in your heart um, that this is an, is an outreach to reach people for Christ. Anytime we have an opportunity to meet our public, we should meet them um, in that regard. So, how better way to teach somebody about Jesus? Um, than to stand in front of them and share a gospel message. So um, I'm excited about that. It's going to be great. So keep those things in mind that we've got coming up. Let's see. Um, I want to invite folks to Sunday school. We've got some uh, pretty good Sunday school classes. Uh, Miss Gaynell, she teaches a wonderful seniors class uh, for our senior ladies that would like to be a part of that. And I hope that you would come and attend, be a part of it. Um, and then Brother Joel teaches our, uh, it's a men's class, it's kind of a mixed class um, as well, I believe. And because uh, I know there's some, a couple ladies, I think it goes in there as well, uh, I think. But anyway, I, he's a phenomenal teacher, so I, I, would, I would encourage you to be a part of that class as well. So we got, we got some young adults that need to be in Sunday school. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it here. Uh, Y'all need to get up a little earlier and come on in because you're missing you're missing out. And then you got Pam. Pam's got a class that meets out in a fellowship building um, that I believe that you would greatly benefit from as well. If you're a lady, uh, they have a good time out there. And so why don't you come be a part of it? There's, there's a place for you. And as our Sunday school grows, uh, we've got youth as well as um, also um, a children's class. Wanda does a children's class and uh, she does a good job with our little kids that, that come as well. So be a part of that if you can. And you say, well, why should I be a part of Sunday School? Well, because it's, 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 it's the place where you connect. Now, as much as I love to stand and preach and teach to you guys, your connections are made in these smaller groups. And we need to be connecting one with another and, and, and growing in those relationships. I realize that we have a young adults class that meets every other week um, off campus. And uh, that is a wonderful group, and they're they're growing in Christ and growing closer together. Um, I hope in the future that we're going to have some more small groups that'll be meeting in that capacity. Um, but we're going to grow into that. So if you're not <coughs> coming and being a part of it, you're missing out. Okay, and I'm saying that out of love. Okay, because I love you and I want you to be a part of it. All right. So with all of that being said, let's get you know we done passed the formalities and all the announcements and the different things that we have to talk about there so what's most important is what we're about ready to do amen and so we're going to get into god's word i may not get very excited tonight um, i actually have my i don't get to do this when i'm at church so i'm just going to take advantage of being at the, at the office i may start bringing a cup i don't know probably not i'll probably knock it off the pulpit or something but anyway um so if I stop periodically and take a drink of water, it's not because I'm trying to be rude. It's because <clears throat> my throat gets a little, a little parched during this time while I'm trying to recover. So, um, but anyway, so let's open up in a word of prayer um, and get into the study of uh, of the Bible, which is what we've, we're here for. So let's pray. Father, it is a privilege to be able to come to you to, today, this afternoon, on a Wednesday evening, and God just be able to bring a word that. I pray will help someone, that it will touch the hearts of those that are longing for a oneness with you, that God, it will draw people closer to you. Lord, I pray today as we, we study through the rest of the book of John in chapter 4, we'll see this big picture of love in a, in a new and a fresh way. It may be just, we may just be repeating this to one to another, but um, Lord, I just ask that you just help us, Lord, to really understand what it is you tried to say um, on the words of this page or these pages. Father, I pray that you'll touch the hearts of people. Lord, for somebody that's listening today that maybe doesn't feel like they're loved, I pray before the day is over with, before the thought is over with, the message that we bring tonight, that they'll know that they are truly loved. And Lord, I just thank you for all that you do. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's get into um, our study here. And, um, and, and I'm going to pick up, um, you know, I wanted to start, I wanted to start in verse number 20, but I'm going to go all the way back to verse number 17. I know we covered 17 
last week, and uh, and actually I think we finished up in uh, 19. But I'm going to look at those three verses again because I need to be able to draw you back into the picture of what's taking place here. Again, remember this is a chapter of love, that what John is doing in uh, this study here in this particular chapter, he's giving us a bird's eye view of what love really looks like. So when you think about love and loving your neighbor and loving friends and loving your family, um, have you ever really just stopped and pondered as to why those emotions are what they are and where they come from? We were created to love. You know, I, I, I know people that, that are hard, man, just hard, hard people. But there's something in their life that they love or someone that they love somewhere along the lines. It may not be uh, a vast group of people, but everybody at some point has some type of love toward another. And, and that was something that was birthed in us. And uh, then there are those who are just really, man, they just understand the concept of love. I mean, they love everybody. And uh, they should. We should all love each other. And, uh, but all of that stuff comes from God. And, and it can't not be mistaken that that's where it comes from. So let's look at verse number 17. And that's where we'll take our, our study um, tonight. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Think about what John is saying here. He said, love has been uh, perfect, or excuse me, perfected among us in this. That love, and we, we discussed this last week, that perfected love is not a love that is outside of the confines of Christ. Remember through the chapter, we, we realized that, that Christ lives in us. And uh, we talked about that. So this love that he's talking about, this perfected love, is a love that lives in us already, which is Christ. And we, we ended up last week talking about how that if we're going to live in that perfected love, we have a responsibility to that. And that responsibility is to surrender to that perfected love. The perfected love is Christ. Surrender to Christ. Let Christ love through you. Let him love in you. And let him use you as a vessel of love. So when he talks about that perfected love among us is this. He's talking about Christ living in us. And he says that we may have uh, boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Meaning that if we're really truly going to love the way we've been designed to love, it's going to be because Christ is the one doing that loving through us. So keep that in mind, folks. Your responsibility is to what? It's to surrender. Surrender to everything that you have in you, which is Christ. We've also said last week that as our responsibility is surrender, uh, we don't have the ability within our own selves to uh, to do anything in its perfected state outside of the perfected Christ who lives in us. So if I don't have the ability to love the way that I've been designed by myself, then i got to have some help. And that help is Christ. So as Christ is my help, then I have to surrender to Him and let Him be the one that does the loving, not me. Because my love's going to fail. His love's never going to fail. His love's eternal. It's always been here. It's never wavered. It's never floundered. It's always been here. And, uh, and it'll always be here. So his love is, 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 is a, it's eternal. It is not conditional. Um, that ought to help you right there, knowing that God's love is not conditional. Whether we love him or not, he's still going to love us. What he uses us for as a, is a vessel of his grace toward other people. So let God be the one who loves in you and through you. Surrender, folks. Remember, don't try to do it yourself. Let God do it. So what does that really look like? It looks like you saying, God, this is not something that I'm capable of doing. So when I don't feel like doing it, Lord, I want you to do it through me. So teach me how to love my neighbor. Teach me how to love my friends. Teach me how to love my spouse. Teach me how to love, um, you know, those that are around me. 
One of the things I do sometimes in marriage counseling is that you know I try to get the point across that the love that a couple has for an, one another will fail if they don't figure out how to surrender and let Christ love their spouse through them. And sometimes that is a difficult thing to do, but it is a necessity. Um, and that, that'll be what gets you through hard times. It'll get you through you know, difficult seasons of your life. It'll be whenever you don't want to go home or whenever you don't want to be married anymore, when you allow Christ to, to love your spouse through you by surrendering to that love that lives in you, that perfected love, you'll be able to make it to the next day. Also try to tell people outside of marriage counseling, but just try to tell people when you have a tough situation in your life, maybe it is somebody who's wronged you. It might be somebody who's hurt you physically or emotionally or spiritually, um, whatever the case may be. And you think to yourself, I can't love this person. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how, how hard it's been for me to, to even be in the same presence as this person. You, you don't understand that. And then you're right, I don't. I may not understand your pain and your sorrows, but I do know this, that gr God is greater than that pain and that sorrow. So just know this, when you learn to live in that perfected love through surrender, God will teach you how to love people. It doesn't necessarily mean relationships are repaired. It just means that your heart is changed toward that person. So let God be the one who loves through you. And then he goes in verse number 18, he says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Think about what he said there. When he talks about that there's he talks about fear in conjunction with love. He said, But a perfect love casts out fear. It's hard sometimes. I, I mentioned just a minute ago, it's hard to love people who've hurt you because you're afraid of what's going to take place um, if you forgive them or you learn to love them regardless of their, um, their offense toward you. Some of the greatest stories of love that I think I've ever you know, heard or hadn't personally witnessed, but I've listened to stories, is where there might be a, um, someone who's spending uh, a stretch in prison, and it could be that they had killed a a uh, person and their family comes alongside them and loves them regardless of what they did to their loved one. See, normally that's not natural. That's not a natural thing for somebody to do. But it's possible through God. And uh, so we've got to learn to be able to cast our fears aside. And in Christ, there's no fears. When we completely surrender something to Christ, He takes that fear away. And that also applies to this whole love element as well, is that whenever we completely surrender to Christ, whatever it is that we are afraid of, then Christ takes that and he multiplies it and he changes your perspective on how to love in that situation. So allow him to love you or to love through you. And that's, again, surrender to the Christ that lives in you. Surrender to the perfected love that lives in you, who is Christ. Then verse number 19, he says, We love him because he first loved us. That's a powerful verse of scripture because he says we love him because he first loved us. See, love was not our, our idea toward God, but it was always God's idea toward us. So when you get to, in a place in your life, and it's, and it's bound to happen, um, to everyone at some point, maybe some worse than others, and you think, you know, I'm just not loved. I want you to know something. You are loved. You're loved by God. It's, it was never the idea of humanity to love God, but it was God's idea to love humanity, and you're a part of that picture. So I want to encourage you just to, to, to grab a hold of that and know that you, you are eternally loved. You've always been in the heart of God. And seeing that you're in the heart of God, that means that you're a special person. I mean, that's pretty exciting just to know that, that, that you and I are special. Others may not think about that, us in that regard, but God does. God looks at us and says, you know, Rick is special. Uh, you are special. You fill your name in that blank. You're special in the eyes of God because he's 
always loved you. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that love that, uh, that he loves us drives us to love him back. See, when you first, when you finally come to a place where you identify that this love that's being mentioned here uh, can be reciprocated back, doesn't it make you feel good that when you finally come to an epiphany in your life and you think, you know what, I'm grateful that God loves me, so maybe I ought to invest myself back into Him and, and learn to love Him like He's loved me. And I'm going to go as far as to say this, we can't love Him the way He's loved us. His love is much more profound. It's a perfect love. We are, we are humans who are in a fallen state. There's going to come a day where we're not. We're going to be able to live in a perfected state. Um, and I can only imagine what love's going to look like and feel like during those times. I, I just, I, my imagination, you know, I think I've got a good imagination, but I don't know that I even scratched the surface of what that's going to feel like. Think about it this way. If you're a parent and um, when your child was born into this world, you found a, a love, <coughs> excuse me, you found a love for that child that you didn't know existed. And, and when you look down into the eyes of that, that little boy or that little girl and you think to yourself, man, this has got to be what love looks like. Then I hear stories about, you know, grandparents who say, you know, um, I look down into the eyes of a grandchild and I, I, and I seen a different kind of love. Just, a, you know, um, uh, um, it, it just radiated within myself the, the love toward that kid that maybe was rekindled. Um, from back when their child was was born into the world, um, or maybe it is that there's an adopted parent or someone who who takes on that responsibility and brings in a child that that they didn't give birth to, but they look at them and they see in their eyes and they realize that they are now a part of them and they love them in a different way. See, that's a that's a wonderful type of a love, and it it certainly feels good to to be able to love that way, but can I tell you that that's a broken type of love? It's broken, It's and, and many times it's conditional. We, we wouldn't want to have to say that out loud, but sometimes it's conditional uh, within ourselves is that we struggle through it from time to time. Maybe it is that a, a child later on in life does something just heinous toward you, and you think to yourself, man, could this even be my child? See, God never looks at us like that. I mean, I'm not saying that a parent would ever just cut that love off for their kid. It's not what I mean. But I'm going to say this here, that we have been very heinous toward God. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've been very heinous toward God in a lot of different things, a lot of different ways in our relationship. We've committed spiritual adultery toward Him way too often. And as a Christian, we continue to do that when we begin to love the things of this world rather than loving God. Our love is conditional. It is it is when we feel good. It is when we we want to love. But God's love is not like that. His love is it's deep. It's deeper than any waters or higher than any mountains or wider than any, you know, any oceans. It is it's it's more vast than anything that we could ever comprehend. So when he says we love him because he first loved us, his love has always existed toward us. And I, I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful that in my lost condition, in my most wicked state, that God didn't give up on me, but yet God loved me in spite of me. And, and I want to love Him back. And the only way to do it, it's going all the way back to verse number 17. That's what we talked about. We have to, what is it? We have to surrender to the perfected love that lives in us, who is Christ. Let's look at verse number 20. We're getting close. We've got a couple more verses. Verse number 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? Think about that with me. Think about what he's asking here, or what he's saying to us. Here's what God is saying to us in that verse of Scripture that I, that I believe. I believe God is telling us that if you want to know if you have surrendered to that perfected love that's in you, then your love for people that you come in contact with will be very evident. It will be, it will be a necessity for you to love them. We've never seen God in flesh. 
because the Bible says that God is a spirit. So those that love him is going to have to love him in spirit and in truth. Um, we're going to ask what the Bible says. We have to worship him in spirit and in truth. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have to lo love the spirit of God. He is a spirit. Now you say, well, what about Jesus? He came in flesh. He did come in flesh. But I want to say this. We've never even seen him. Not a one of us alive today has ever seen Jesus. Only, a, you know, uh, for a period of 33 years did people ever see Jesus here on this earth. But yet the love for him has, has transcended, you know, from generation to generation. And why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And that perfected God, that perfected love of God lives in us. So he, he rekindles that over and over um, toward himself through us. So if we're going to say that we love God, now we can sit here this afternoon and we can say we've got a love for God. You know, I see people all the time say, oh, I love God. But their life doesn't prove that. You know, I hear people a lot of times say, you know, I, boy, I just love Jesus. But, buddy, I'm telling you, you got a sour attitude toward people. That you, you're not, you ain't fooling me. You're not fooling other people. And you may be fooling yourself, but you ain't fooling others. Because God is love, and God told us to love our neighbors. God told us to love the people who are what society sometimes even seems to be unlovable or unredeemable. God said, love those people. Love the ones who are broken. Love the ones who are misunderstood. Love the ones that are mischaracterized. Love those people. You, it's easy to love you. It's easy to love a kid or, you know, even love somebody who even kind of loves you back a little bit. But you really want to know if you love God? Find yourself in a situation where you are forced to love the people that you're surrounded by. And let's just see how much love you really have. See how much love for God that you really have, because that's the litmus test here. God's saying, in this passage of Scripture, He's saying, if you say, He's, he's saying, if, if you're verbalizing, I love God and hate His brother, He says this, He brings some strong language. He says, He's a liar. That's not, that's not Rick saying that. That's not any other preacher or any other Bible teacher saying that. That is the Bible saying that. If you say, if someone says, hey, I love God and I hate my neighbor, then the Bible calls you a liar. There's no way around that. Now, we either believe what the Bible says or we don't. So, the next time you find yourself in a situation where you look at somebody and you're thinking, I just hate their stinking guts, man. Just can't stand them. You need, you need to check yourself. This preacher too, man. I have to do that from time to time, man. I have to say, Lord, is that really how I feel about somebody? God, is that really where I'm at right now? And, and, and then me and God have to work through things. There's been people in my life, there's, there's been hard times where I've, I've looked at somebody and I've thought to myself, man, psh, if they just fall off the face of the earth, it'd be all right. I'm just telling on Rick today. Hey, I'm just telling on me today. But then me and God had to wrestle through that. And then we have to we have to come to an understanding. And my understanding is his way. It's not I don't compromise that. I can't compromise that because if I say that I love God, and I'm telling you right now, I love him. I do. I love him. Then he said, prove it. Prove it. Don't just tell me that you love me. Prove it. And the only way to prove that is to love sometimes the unlovable. Love those that others don't want to love. Love your family. Love your neighbors. Again, I'm going to say this again. That doesn't mean you have to build relationships with them, but that does mean that you've got to love them. There's... You know, there's probably hate relationships that go on. I know there are. There's hate relationships that go on between people all the time who never have communication one with another. Wrestle with that for a minute. There's, there's relationships that people have with others that they don't even know that they're having with them um, because it's out of hate. Why don't we just flip the script on that and say, God, teach me to love them. I may not ever speak to them, may not ever be around them, may not ever come in contact with them again. 
Um, but God just turned that emotion around because if I can't love them, then how am I going to say that I love you? And then I'm going to go as far as to say this, that sometimes loving your neighbor is has to play itself out. You have to demonstrate that love. It's not always, but you've got to demonstrate that love. It first starts with an emotion. It first starts with wrestling where you stand with God. Because if I say I love God and I can't love my neighbor, I'm a liar. So there's going to be times where it's going to have to be played out. There's going to be times where it's going to be hard and difficult and messy. But God said, if you love me, you got to love your neighbor. If you love me, and you say that you love me, but you hate your neighbor, he said, you're a liar. Okay? Now, let's move along. It says, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. Now, he said, how can you love God whom you have not seen? So if you can't love the people that you do see, how in the world can you expect to love a God that you've never seen? That's strong, strong language. But God's serious about this love thing. See, and, and I'm, I'm just at the, of the school of thought that the reason that he, um, he's given these type of passages to us is so that we understand while he is not here for us to lean on as a crutch and stand in his shadow and let him be the one love and us just say, yep, that's right. He uses us as a front person to carry out his mission his purpose and his will. So God's using you as a front man or a front woman. You know what I mean by front man and front woman? Concerts, you go to a concert and they got a front man or they got a front woman, somebody who stands out front, the band plays in the background. You know, most Christians want to be the guy that plays the drums. Nobody pays attention to the drummer. I, I guarantee you right now, most bands, you can't tell who the drummer is. You may see them, but you don't even know who they are. Like me included. You just know the front man. Jesus said, won't you be the front man? Let me teach you how to do it because you can't see me. So I'm going to use you to do what I would do if I was there. So, it's kind of a strange analogy. That's just what popped in my head. Funny things pop in my head sometimes. Verse number 21, he says, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. He said, this commandment that we've got, if you're going to love me, you're going to love your brother also. That's plain and simple. Just plain and simple. So I wanted to bring it to a close on that verse of Scripture, which is the last verse in chapter number 4. And I want to say this here, that this whole chapter in chapter 4, like I said at the beginning of this, gives us a bird's eye view, a 10,000 foot perspective of what love looks like and where it comes from, where it's generated from. Love is generated from God. It is not something that we take uh, too naturally, but it's something that we have to be cultivated into and through. God has given us guidelines. He's told us who we have to love, why we have to love them, and in what occasions we have to love them at all times. So it may be something that you're going to have to wrestle through. There may be somebody in your life that you're thinking about right now that I'm having a hard time with. It might be somebody that you work with that, that's just giving you the business, man. I mean, they're just they're giving you the business. You ever got the business? Well, they're giving it to you. And you, you think to yourself, man, if they just fall off the face of the earth, it'd be all right. No, you, you can't think like that. You've got to love them. Remember what he said. If I say I love God, you know, if I hate my neighbor, you know, if I don't love my neighbor, then I'm a liar. It might be somebody in your family that you've got a broken relationship with and you just can't deal with them anymore. Uh, they may have said some things or done some things or hurt you and in some ways that, that you're not even willing to, to, to discuss. While it may be very hard and, miss, and, and, and you can't quite understand why they did what they did, God said you've got to love them. It doesn't mean you've got to go break bread with them, but you've got to love them. How about that child that has gone astray? Maybe that child that has, that has hurt you. I mean, you poured yourself into that kid. And over time, something has went awry and, and, and your relationship has been just destroyed and that love that you once had for them has maybe faded. Listen to them, you gotta love them anyway. Love them, just love them. 
I mean, there's there's a host of different things that we could talk about in regards to those relationships. But listen to me, child of God. If you say you love God, then you've got to love those that are around you. As difficult as it, as it is, you see, you don't know my situation. I don't. But I know that God, you say that you that you love, and I know what He said about love. So if that being the case, if Christ lives in you, and you say you love Him, surrender to the perfected love in you, and let Him do the loving for you. And I promise you this, He'll help you through it. It may not take, it may not happen just overnight. You know, I've, I've preached along these lines for years uh, in regards to these passages of scriptures, and, and, and I've heard testimony of people who say, you know what? When you first talked about that, I didn't want to. I didn't want to hear it. You don't know what happened in my life. I didn't want to hear that, so I just tuned you out. But then God started dealing with me. And then I had to do something about it, and it and it it was process. It took took time. I'm thinking about somebody right now who was dealing with a situation that was just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Something that happened to them as a child, and I couldn't even wrap my mind around. But over a period of time. They had to work through it. And as they worked through it, God released that. When you become released to something like that, you take and unlock the prison that you're putting yourself in and swing the door wide open and say, that's not my place. That's not where I dwell. I dwell with the Most High. And I dwell in the love that He has for me. So, I want to conclude this thought here tonight. And next week we're going to pick up in chapter number 5. And, um, and it's going to be good. We're going to finish up, hopefully, I don't know, we might go down to about verse number 5 next week, and we'll just kind of see where the Scriptures take us. But I hope that it's been a help to you tonight, and I appreciate you watching and being a part of this study. Um, and, and if it's helping you, why don't you help somebody else with it as well? You know, let's not just take it and, and just hoard it up, but let's, let's help somebody else get released from things that, that are binding them. So... Until Sunday morning, um, I want to say I love you, and uh, I want to see you on Sunday morning. I hope that you come. I want you to bring somebody with you, and uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of the Gospel of John. I know we're in the first John on Wednesdays. We're in the Gospel of John. It'll be my 10th message um, in the Gospel of John, okay? So um, I want you to be there, all right? Bring somebody with you, and until then... May God bless you, and uh, I'm going to pray before we leave. Father, thank you. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you've accomplished here today. Thank you, dear Lord, for the, the idea of love that you, um, that you instituted from the very beginning. Lord, it's always been here. You are eternal. God, we, we put things in context of time, but God, you are eternal, and you've always loved us. I don't understand how that is or what that is or what that really truly looks like, but I just have to believe that eternity has always existed with you loving us. So Lord, help us to love you. And I know the way that we love you is by loving others. And Father, if there's somebody who is broken today, that's having a hard time, that's struggling, Lord, you would you release them from that? Would you help them to unlock the door of that prison that's keeping them bound? And God, would you help them to swing it wide open and say, that's not my place. But I live in the, the uh, loving arms of Christ. And Father, we just praise you for what you do. And thank you for everybody who's watched today. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen.